Are you sitting comfortably? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and anybody else who happens to be watching. Um, as is traditional every year, this is the bits from the DPL, so I would like to welcome the one and only Lucas Nisbaum. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Ooh, does it work? Yeah, okay, that's fine. So, uh, to start this talk, I wanted to look back a bit about what we achieved as a project since, uh, since uh, last year, DEPCONF last year, because I think that this was a great year for Debian. First, we made decision the init system debate, init system choice. Uh, that's, so that was hard, but we made it. We uh, set up LTS support for Squeeze. That's also something that's been discussed for a few years and it is finally starting and working. Um, if you look at uh, what others think about Debian, I think that uh, shows that Debian is stronger than ever as a foundation. Uh, after the decision on systemd, uh, Ubuntu followed just a few uh, days uh, after that. Uh, Valve shows uh, Debian as a basis for SteamOS. That shows that uh, people look at Debian and see a strong foundation for their own projects and follow our technical choices. So there have been many uh, new exciting developments, uh, such as Debian Net, Tracker, Debian Org, uh, Debian Contributors, uh, Debian CI, and many more to come if you look at the schedule for DevConf. And uh, the Jesse freeze is looking quite good. We are down to 340 RC bugs. If you look at the stats for the previous releases, which, it means that we are at about 21 weeks to release. So if you just, just hurry up a bit, we can release by Christmas, basically. Well, that maybe that's uh, a bit uh, of a dream, but uh, who knows? We'll see. <laughs> OK, so I wanted to, to use that talk to talk about things that uh, were discussed quite a bit during the DPL election, and that might be boring to some of you, but I think it's important that we take a look at uh, Debian, Debian's financial status to understand where we are. Uh, so in that talk, all values are in US dollars, since we are in the, in the US, uh, which means that even if you see a value about uh, FFIS, which usually which holds funds in uh, Euro, for example, or Debian CH, I've converted it using uh, those rates. That was the rates a few, a few days ago. So first, um, Debian funds are not held directly by Debian, but Debian uses a set of trusted organizations. Uh, to that, so basically, Debian has a bank accounts at several organizations. Uh, each organization uh, provides a different level of service and detail about uh, money that they add uh, about Debian, which means that uh, doing all those stats actually takes a lot of time and requires quite a lot of uh, scripting. Um, so the current list of uh, Debian trusted organizations is the following. So we have SPI in the US, uh, which uses US dollars, FFIS in Germany that uses Euro, uh, Debian France in France, which uses Euro, Euro as well, DebConf Deutschland, uh, which uses Euro, and Debian CH in Switzerland, which uses Swiss francs. So the current balance is the following. Uh, so for SPI, the data uh, is from the end of June because they haven't published a report for the end of July yet. Um, so the two main trusted organizations for which we, which we use the most for, uh, to make expenses uh, are SPI and FFIS, that's why they, that's why they are in bold. Um, we have about um, uh, $30,000 at both FFIS and uh, Debian CH. Uh, $4,000 at Debian France and zero uh, at DeepConf De 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 Deutschland. So, what's more interesting? Okay, so yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I didn't ask, I should have. <laughs> um, so, more interesting than the current balance, um, let's look at how it changed over time. So, uh, so that graph is about SPI, that one is about FIS. Uh, I could not generate it for Debian CH, but it's probably less, uh, well, less interesting to look at, because it's mostly the DebConf 13 surplus. So for SPI, the purple part, so that's time. That's, I'm not sure if you can read in the uh, back of the room, that's 2009, that's 2014. 
The purple part is uh, Debian fonts, and the various other parts are, are fonts for various uh, DebConf editions. So blue one here is DebConf 14, uh, that's DebConf 13, etc. So uh, one can see that it has been increasing quite steadily, especially during the last two years, thanks to uh, the great work done by uh, the DebConf 13 sponsoring team. Probably for DebConf, yeah. <laughs> uh, probably for DebConf 14, it's going to drop a little because there are things to pay. <laughs> we are not here for free. But uh, still, uh, it is expected that DebConf 14 will, will also generate a surplus. So, Spend, spend the money on travel sponsoring. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it looks a bit exponential actually in the end. I don't think it is. <laughs> Still, it's a bit scary. <laughs> um, for FFIS, it's a lot more stable. It has been going down a bit recently, but that's just because we have been using FFIS, FFIS for quite a lot of uh, quite large expenses uh, since the beginning of the year. But, uh, that actually starts in 2002, so you see that uh, yeah, that's, that's always been between uh, almost zero and uh, $60,000. So I tried to look at uh, various uh, aspects that are related to uh, uh, Debian money. First, donations. So I've passed the data about credit card donations to SPI uh, account. So those donations are processed through a third-party service called Click and Pledge. So if you go to the debian.org slash donations webpage, uh, you get a link. If you want to donate via SPI, you get a link to a page that looks like that. Um, and actually what's important for the next slide is that that form enables you to donate to various organizations, not just Debian, but you have a long list of organizations where you can, which you can donate to. So that's um, uh, actual numbers. So the, that's the year, of course. That's a total uh, donation to Debian for the given year. So for 2014, that's up, up to a few days ago. Um, that's the total donations, total of donations where Debian was involved. So what happens is that you can go to that page and decide to donate uh, $150. 100 to Debian and 50 to another organization, for example, OpenWT. So that's the total of donations. That's a, that would be 150, and that's the 100 that goes to Debian. So one can see that the median value uh, for donations is actually really stable. We get a lot of small donations. Uh, it's important to remember that, that uh, there are lots of individuals uh, giving small amount of money to Debian. Uh, it's actually fairly stable if you consider the fact that uh, in 2010, 2001, uh, 11, 2012, we got three large donations uh, using credit cards. So if you remove that, basically it's, uh, it's stable over the years. It's, it looks like we are a bit um, lower than, uh, well, we are two-thirds of the year if you multiply it by, well, uh, if you do the computation for 2014, the projection looks a bit low, but that's also probably expected because we get lots of donations at the end of the year. I think that's because U.S. citizens do a tax report at the end of the year, and uh, that's the point of time where they decide that it's a good idea to give to give to to Debian. So December is usually the big month for our donations. So just if you have clarification questions about that, just uh, just ask. Yeah. Can these be available again? So now that all the script uh, all the scripts are written, uh, yeah, well, it would be quite easy to regenerate uh, the data. Yeah. <coughs> oh yeah, so I will just repeat the, that kind of questions, but. Uh, uh, I was asked whether the data would be available again at the end of the year. <laughs> so let's look at expenses. So the question is, how does Debian spend money on? What, what does Debian spend money on? So the first well, big expense for Debian is uh, DebConf. The budget uh, varies quite a lot depending on where DebConf takes place. <coughs> because of the new cost, for example, that varies quite a lot. 
uh, it's between 150k, uh, okay, uh, 150,000 dollars and 2,000 dollars per year, uh, including travel sponsorship. For this year, it was 42,000 uh, dollars. Um, we spend quite a lot of money on other kind of travels for sprints. Um, some, but not so much on uh, Debian developers attending, traveling to upstream conferences. That, that occurred two or three times uh, this year, I think. Um, we found some other events, for example, mini DevConf, uh, to, ease, uh, to make it easier for people to, for speakers to travel to mini DevConf. Uh, we funded uh, Tales Hackfest uh, in July. We also spent quite a lot of money on infrastructure, so uh, hardware, of course, but also stuff like DNS uh, domain names, uh, SSL certificates, uh, hardware warranty. So I don't have the data, uh, the detailed breakdown for SPI, which would be more interesting, but actually <laughs> a lot more work to, uh, to do. That's the data for FF FFIS, so it's mostly an example because the amount spent at, as at FFIS is a bit uh, is much lower than uh, at SPI. But it shows that uh, basically it's split about uh, evenly between infrastructure related and travel related. So some thoughts about uh, that. First, I think that before uh, talking about uh, Rojas, I think it's important to states that we must respect our donors and to use uh, their donations to improve Debian. So that's actually, uh, it's quite interesting. Well, there are two sides to this. First thing is we should use the donations to improve Debian. But we should, should also use the donations. And uh, if they donate money to Debian, I don't think that it's quite right uh, to just have it sitting in a bank account. Uh, of course, it's important that we have uh, some amount of uh, reserve uh, in case of uh, well, emergency expenses, but it does. But with, with having almost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on our bank bank accounts might be a bit too much. So yeah, my point: we have enough reserves. Uh, we have basically what would be needed for one full Debcon. So I'm not encouraging the Debcon 15 team to fail completely, but still. <laughs> We could afford that, <laughs> but please don't. <laughs> we could probably improve on fundraising. Uh, we had a both, both with this morning about this. There are lots of uh, ideas uh, flying around about uh, how to improve fundraising. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, if we were slightly more aggressive, we would be able to raise a lot more. And uh, we sometimes feel too guilty about using Debian money. I've heard of people who are really core contributors to Debian, who spend a lot of time on Debian, and who decided not to come to DebConf uh, because they didn't feel that it was right for the project to pay for that, uh, for that travel. Uh, they couldn't afford it themselves, so uh, they decided not to apply. That's really sad because probably it would have been really useful to, to have them here. So uh, we had a discussion, many this discussion last year about uh, ideas for spending more money. Uh, I've tried to go through it and uh, summarize it on these slides. So I think that there are many ways that we could use to make, to make good use of Debian money and spend more money. Uh, the first set of ideas is about increasing visibility of Debian and attracting more contributors. So we could help more the organization of mini debt confs. Uh, that's a good way to reach out to our users and potential contributors. Uh, one way to do that is to sponsor uh, Debian developers to travel to such events and talk, so talk about uh, Debian development. Uh, the second point is likely to be uh, less consensual. Uh, I think that uh, we could use some money to uh, just to, to to send a, a signal to our new contributors that uh, we appreciate that they are contributing to Debian and uh, welcome them to, to our community. For example, uh, sending uh, quite cheap goodies like a t uh, on the order of a t-shirt uh, to, to new contributors. I think that's something that we could, that we could do. 
Um, I'm thinking of uh, spending something like $5,000 uh, per year uh, on that. I think that's, that's a, that would be quite reasonable. And it, it would be a first step, a first nice step uh, before, well, saying them, to say to them that we notice that they are starting to contribute. We kind of know that uh, DM, well, becoming a DM and bec or becoming a DD is a really long path, but at least yeah, we, we know that uh, they are there. Um, something else is material for Debian Boost. So we have a Debian event team that, uh, that uh, set up a kind of Debian event box can be sent to, to events mainly in Europe. It's actually kind of empty. Uh, so it would be a good idea to work on uh, buying stuff like banners uh, and other materials that are frequently used um, at uh, conferences. Uh, another thing that was uh, discussed uh, is uh, imp improving security and trust of the uh, of Debian, the, uh, Debian archive by buying uh, cryptographic cards uh, for DDs. Um, we, we could also do more about improving the efficiency of development, organize prints. So, uh, so I think that's the message I want to... So, yeah. so uh, let's, okay, I'm quite sure that not all of this, uh, has, uh, well, some of this might be a bit uh, controversial. Let's discuss it at the end of the talk. Let's not start a big discussion right now. Uh, I hope that there will be time to discuss this. Um, but if you have clarification questions, I'm fine with taking them now. So, uh, yeah, so regarding sprints, uh, there are quite a lot of sprints that are being organized, uh, mostly by core teams. I think that uh, we can extend to more teams and have, uh, uh, we, have we, don't, we don't have that many packaging, team, uh, pack packaging teams meeting using sprints. We could totally uh, do more of that. So hardware used for Debian development. So I don't think that we can afford buying laptops for Debian developers. But uh, when uh, someone needs uh, specialized hardware, could be uh, portal machines for well, development machines uh, for portals. Um, last year we bought a quite powerful system so that uh, one of the DI maintainers could do builds of DI uh, at home uh, with a fast machine. So that kind of expenses, I think that something that we, we could do more as well. And uh, yeah, and then finally, more travel sponsorship for DevConf. Uh, I don't think that we can afford sponsoring every DM plus DD to DevConf, but um, probably we should look into uh, sponsoring uh, more or even a lot more. Like for example, for DMs, uh, it's quite nice to have them at DevConf, get uh, get involved in the community, and that's usually, well, probably most of uh, you have. Well, <laughs> Uh, realize that, but uh, once you are at DevConf, you talk with a lot of people, and usually, as a result, uh, you do more in the future uh, in terms of Debian development. Um, and then, last point about improving communication with upstreams. Uh, we could sponsor travel and attendance to some <coughs> upstream conferences. For example, it would totally make sense for. Uh, Debian to sponsor uh, uh, travel and attendance to uh, PyCon for our Python developers if they cannot uh, find another way to attend. And that's really important to, to have a good communication with our upstream developers. So I think there was a suggestion at some point to have dinner once a year uh, with your upstream. I don't think that Debian should pay. <laughs> Well, maybe it uh, depends on the kind of dinner, but uh, <laughs> that's something that could be discussed. But um, still, that's the kind of things that, uh, uh, if it contributes to uh, Debian development, why not? So just to be clear, I'm actually uh, in favor of everything listed here. So there are things that clearly need uh, coordinators. So if you want to volunteer about uh, working on them, just contact me. So just before uh, moving on to the rest of the talk, uh, I'd like just to do a quick show of hands for each item so that uh, 
we know where people stand. So for each item, I will ask two, two questions. Who would be in support of uh, spending the project's money on this particular item? Who would not be in support of spending the project money on a particular item? So first one, help organization of Mindev Conf. Who would be in support? Okay. Who wouldn't be in support? Uh, reducing our current uh, spending of money on such thing, probably possibly to zero. Well, currently we are spending money on this, so. So, goodies for new contributors. Who would be in support? Okay. Who wouldn't be in support? <coughs> so, I would say about 70 of 80% of people are in support. Just to give it, just for the for the video because we are not uh, recording the room. And uh, it was 100 percent uh, for the first items. So material for Debian booth who would be in support. Okay, who wouldn't be in support. Okay, so probably 80 or 90 percent. Um, Cryptographic smart cards for DDs would be in support. Okay. <laughs> 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 who, would, who wouldn't be in support? Okay, so 90% at least. 95%. Uh, sprints would be in support. Who wouldn't be in support? Okay, so 95%. Hardware used for Debian development, who would be in support? Who wouldn't be in support? Okay, 100%. <laughs> I said no laptops. <laughs> uh, more travel sponsorship for DebConf would be in support. <laughs> Who wouldn't be in support? Okay, 100%. And uh, sponsoring travel plus attendance to upstream conferences, who would be in support? Who would not be in support? Okay, 100%. Okay, so as kind of expected, the most uh, unpopular one is uh, goodies for new contributors, but uh, there's at least 70% support for all of them. So we, can, we will be able to discuss this at the end of the talk. Uh, I made it quite short too, so that we have time to, to talk about this. I'm not going to just uh, think that uh, there might be good points in the 30% uh, that disagree. So the second part of the talk, I wanted to do some, uh, let's say, think tank about uh, Debian. Uh, so I don't know who is familiar with um, SWOT analysis. So the idea is to try to look at um, uh, strength weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, to Debian in that case, and look at uh, yeah, what can we build on in terms of strength, what are the, or in terms of opportunities. So the difference between uh, strength and opportunities or between weaknesses and threats is that strength are uh, in, from an internal origin, so that we are stuff that we build ourselves, and uh, opportunities are stuff that have an external origin, that is stuff that came from the outside. It just happened to happen at the same time as uh, uh, currently. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, and weaknesses and threats are things that uh, are, are or might be uh, harmful to us now or in the future. So I tried to do the, that work. You might disagree with me. So let's go <coughs> through it. So first, a strength. I think that what's quite uh, really great in Debian is that when you talk to people, there's a strong uh, shared common uh, uh, ideas and goals uh, among contributors. We all uh, are feel very strongly about uh, our general uh, goals. We might disagree on many small details. Uh, that's, for example, what is free software and what isn't. Uh, but still, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that uh, it's quite, for, for an organization, that's really great that we agree on so much and care so much about uh, it. There's also widespread agreement about our foundation documents and procedures. Of course, uh, the secretary might sometimes have things to say about particular 
things, but still uh, we all care deeply about respecting uh, uh, those documents. And maybe even a bit too much, maybe a bit too conservative sometimes about uh, those documents. But, uh, <laughs> um, everybody cares about Debian and likes it, even when not using it. If you look at the system D debate, it was uh, all over the news. Uh, uh, because everybody looks at Debian and cares about it and everybody loves Debian. When you go to conferences, not DebConf, and uh, you say that you are involved in Debian, everybody, even use, using uh, derivatives, uh, says that they are really fa big fans of Debian uh, with a deep respect for, for the project. Uh, we have a large active community of volunteers. Um, that's uh, so. I was wondering uh, earlier this week: Does someone know of larger free software projects other than Debian, community projects? I think that Debian is clearly by far the largest uh, community uh, free software project, and uh, that, that it works so well in some sense. Uh, it's really uh, yeah. How many are you talking? What are the numbers on that? So we have uh, 1,000 uh, official developers plus about 300 uh, DMs, 240 DMs, plus uh, a lot of people who are just contributing without any official status. And uh, to a single project, I mean, if you take the Python community as a whole, it's probably uh, larger than that. But uh, to a single, uh, under a single umbrella, I think that uh, that's really large. Uh, also, uh, Debian is independent, and we don't compromise with it, and that's, that's actually something that is probably quite attractive to uh, many other entities. If you look at uh, companies, from a company point of, uh, com point of view, the fact that uh, someone can join the community and don't feel like they are joining an uh, inside company name shop uh, is actually uh, quite great, and probably that's why uh, Companies like uh, Valve or more recently uh, HP uh, are looking into uh, working with Debian. So in terms of uh, opportunities, we are probably one of the, one of the few remaining large community, fully community projects, uh, and, or at least dis distribution in terms of size, we are probably by far the largest. Many other uh, projects are becoming more and more company oriented. And I think that we all care deeply about the fact that uh, we are remaining, remaining mostly independent from any, uh, any company. There's also, uh, following uh, all the uh, Snowden stuff, hostility towards some big corporate players. And by, being, by having such independence, I think that we are in a great position to, to succeed. To success. succeed. So now let's look at the darker sides. And our weaknesses. Actually, the slide is a bit longer. That's not a good sign. But <laughs> first point is uh, we tend to well, we are a large uh, project, but there's some dispersion of manpower. Uh, so the slides will be available. I see people taking pictures, but uh, <laughs> that's not, that might not be useful. So there's a dispersion of manpower. We have lack of manpower. There's a lack of manpower on core things. Most of our core teams are clearly uh, lack, lack, lack help and would use a lot, of, a lot more help. But also a lack of interest and contributors to non-technical tasks. Uh, if you try to do uh, auditors both or a fundraising both, you will see that uh, those are the most unpopular uh, events at DebConf. Uh, I've been to both. So <laughs> but, uh, and that's a bit um, strange. I mean, uh, that's important as well for the success of Debian, and uh, it's quite interesting to see so many people in favor of spending more money, but at the same time not being so interested in attending a fundraising booth. Um, there's some um, quite a, that's probably unexpected, unavoidable due to the size of Debian, but there's some fragmentation uh, inside Debian. We, are, we tend to have teams that. W Become their own their own projects and don't share that much as they as much as they used to with the rest of the project. So one good example is uh, uh, Git packaging workflows. For many years, we had different workflows in each team, basically, 
Uh, so Rafael Herzog just added some work to try to move towards fixing that, but still uh, we probably could uh, have more exchange more between teams. Another example is um, uh, each uh, scripting language that tends to have its own solution for uh, switching switches between transitions between versions. That's something that uh, having a kind of overview of what each team is doing and what are the pros and cons of each solution could be quite useful. Um, packaging is difficult. Uh, if you, even if, well, if, when you talk to people who are really strong uh, developers or sysadmins, and you ask them to do their, their first Debian package, usually it's quite hard for them, and the success rate is actually quite low. Uh, and this probably limits the use of packages as a standard software distribution mechanism. Uh, if, our, if it was easier to build Debian packages, maybe we don't have so many uh, alternative and language-specific uh, packaging systems. Uh, it's very difficult to get started in Debian. Uh, so I did recently, uh, I looked recently as, uh, at uh, old um, ITPs and uh, yeah, mostly ITPs bugs, and there are lots of people who did the work of uh, creating a Debian package for something and who gave up because uh, they could not find a sponsor. We also have quite high requirements about quality. Uh, most of the package that uh, managed to get sponsored out of mentors are probably of much higher quality on average than uh, packages uh, did is upload. Uh, well, without any, uh, any review. Uh, maybe that's a bit uh, unreasonable and we, just, we should just uh, file bugs about uh, minor issues and not care so much about uh, Lintian pedantic tags. Um, there's also some disconnection from upstream for many maintainers. Uh, by that I mean that uh, uh, the maintainer works on its package but has, has never exchanged an email uh, to uh, one of the, uh, to the upstream uh, developers community. And uh, there was a blog post from uh, Lior Kaplan uh, on Planet Debian today about this, but that's really something that uh, yeah, we should try to, to improve. So some threats, so external things. There's a perception, a growing perception that uh, distributions are solved problems and we are, we are not cool anymore and all the cool kids are doing something else at working in distributions. That probably wasn't the case 10 years ago. I think that we have a lot of things to do as distributions, lots of interesting problems to solve and the schedule at, at DebConf shows a lot of things that uh, distributions can contribute to solving. But still, that's uh, us, and we need to be to communicate this to to the rest of the world, so that uh, yeah, we are not perceived as the old guys that do uh, all the boring stuff. Um, the required skills to work on Debian are actually quite rare and not typically not taught in typical university uh, curriculums. Uh, if you look at uh, projects doing web development, for example. Every student uh, doing computer science knows about web development. What's required in Debian for to contribute to Debian is a bit uh, unclear, actually. It's a mix of development skills, sysadmin skills, deep uh, systems skills. And uh, yeah, that's something that is not taught anymore at universities. And it makes it uh, much more difficult for us to recruit students for programs like GSOC or to recruit uh, new contributors. And actually when, so maybe you know about gift bugs, so the name is not quite good, but um, the idea was to tag bugs that are suitable for new contributors. And there are very few bugs tagged uh, like that, and very few turnover about uh, those bugs getting fixed. Probably because we have problems identifying what, uh, what's the level of skills expected from new contributors. Um, there's also an increasing competition with emerging language-specific packaging solutions. Uh, I can't think of a scripting language or yeah, high-level language right now that doesn't have its own packaging solution. Uh, can you think of one? <laughs> Maybe not Haskell, but um, that's uh, that's the kind of kind of a failure for Debian for not having or for distributions in general not having been able to uh, impose uh, Debian packages as a de facto standard. 
So as I said, uh, I wanted to uh, leave a lot of space for discussion today. Uh, the slides are available here to make it easier to discuss. I will just copy paste uh, the, the slides okay, that are going to be the most uh, discussed probably on Gobi. So there's a Gobi document in the talk, talk uh, uh, subdirectory. And well, thank you. And, uh, I'm waiting for your questions or comments or whatever. Uh, with the, that is, we want to maybe is it so rest and again. Um, so I don't know if you were in uh, Stefano's talk um, on Saturday. I think it was. Um, he identified something that. Some, some things that I think probably ought to be on our radar as threats, um, and possibly also as opportunities. <coughs> Do you think those are important? Um, let me... So, uh, yeah, I thought about that. Uh, so, yeah, I, th I think that's a threat for the, clearly a threat for the free software community. Uh, I'm not sure if Debian has so much to contribute to solving this uh, as a distribution. Um, one, so, well, probably it, uh, there's some improvement to be done in making it easier for users to install software so that they can run their own infrastructure, their own uh, uh, web services. But that's something that uh, we have not been able to do well, probably, yeah, we need people to work on web applications packaging, update a policy on web application. Uh, the current one uh, dates from about 10 years ago. It's totally probably um, unsuitable to recent um, uh, web applications. Uh, we need to fix that problem before, uh, I think, uh, going further in that area. That's a problem that we know has existed for a long time. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that comment you made about DebConf and the um, you know, show of hands about uh, travel sponsorship and uh, just wanted to say that we're very well aware of this um, and we would like to spend more money on travel sponsorship and get more people involved if they can, if they have the time. In the past it's always been a little bit of a time constraint and this year actually we had more money set aside than was actually claimed so we got some money back. Um, this means two things. First of all, I think we should uh, start a little earlier and we are on that so that it's easier to plan your time and uh, and get uh, vacation approved and second uh, we also need to encourage people that uh, as a matter of fact your participation is important and we will help you do it and uh, that's the job for all of you guys and we'll work on the rest So one of the things you listed as a threat, the idea that the packaging skills are a combination of system administration and development skills, um, given that I just had a giant uh, argument with that with the previous employer, um, the, I, one of the things I want to call out there is that we have an opportunity uh, in being clear about what we do inside Debian, I think, to attract a lot more people by making by making the point that the things that you do in Debian as part of building a package is actually DevOps skills. So that combination of development plus system administration is something that uh, the industry has been fighting about for years. And the DevOps camp that says that you should do both of those things together in one team with one set of people is mostly winning. Um, and if we can point out that, and I tried to point this out at my talk about enterprise system administration and in, for Debian in New York, um, that those really that the skills that you do as Debian packaging are DevOps skills, are enterprise system administration skills, and vice versa. Anyone who can do DevOps can do Debian packaging. Um, that might be an opportunity for us to get more attention and more um, attract more contributors and make it look cooler. Uh, to address one of your other points. Um, on spending money, I'd, Can you stand? 
spending money, I'd like to see the LWN editors at DevCon 15. Also, the um, package specific, um, language specific package managers, I see that as an opportunity rather than a threat because it means that we can develop tools to easily turn those into Debian packages. So I'd like to hear from people who did not support the idea of uh, goodies for... Actually, you had, you had a comment on chat, but uh, yeah, that one. Uh, oh, yep, okay. I was just going to point out that um, if we do buy cryptographic smart cards, that does violate uh, the keyring team's requirement of uh, 4K keys because, as far as I know, um, the maximum key like. <laughs> yeah, no. Turn around? Okay. Yes. That's true. 2K keys are fine. 2K, yeah. Because really? as far as problem solved. Problem solved. Uh, my, my understanding is, first of all, that you can convince the open PGP cards to do 4K keys. There's a trick to it where you tell it to generate a 4K key and then it realizes it can and it's all good. Um, 2K keys, only in exceptional circumstances, prove to me it's a good idea. Otherwise, 4K keys, so do the trick on the card to get a 4K key. My concern about cryptographic smart cards is we order a thousand cryptographic smart cards and then all of a sudden, hmm, what do I do? Let's see, Al Trojan, a thousand cryptographic smart cards for Debian. I'm not sure how to do reliable distribution for it. Um, I think it would certainly help in many ways, but, but there are complicated things which is much more than just the money around it. Yeah. Um, That's why it's in red on that slide, actually. I'm not, I'm not going to work on that myself. Uh, People can, well, if you figure out uh, how to solve the technical issue, uh, I think you can consider the money issue to be solved. That's my point. If that's not worked, it's going to be, to be done uh, for nothing. We can buy them uh, if on the technical side we are fine uh, with buying them. Thank you. I think we're out of time. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, many thanks to Lucas. Many thanks to those who.